I'd like to thank, um, uh, first of all, um, my partners in, in crime for this year's, this year's event. Um, the um, Three Aminals talk series is hosted and used to be hosted by the Centre for Grand Strategy and the King's Japan programme. But this year, I am particularly uh, delighted that uh, the Royal Navy Centre for Strategic Studies and the uh, uh, Sea Power Centre Australia um, join forces with us in order to make this event possible. Um, and obviously, being a, when we when we sort of started to think the concert about this um, the three animals talk, um, we did not know that it would become so fashionable that international politics would bend to our will. And so, in September, um, uh, Australia, um, the United Kingdom, and the United States came together. Um, and um, forged this new defence uh, bridge with this new defence pact, um, with a first sort of project to be delivered around uh, Australia's next generation uh, submarine capabilities. Um, and we thought that why not? Let's take that as our cue for the gathering this year. I'm particularly pleased to be joined by uh, in person here today by Admiral uh, Sir uh, uh, Philip Jones who recently retired as the first Sea Lord here in the United Kingdom. And then online, um, we have remotely connected Vice Admiral uh, Tim Barrett, who retired as well as Chief of Navy in Australia, and soon, hopefully, um, Admiral John Richardson, uh, who also retired um, as um, um, uh, Chief um, of Naval Operations at, in, with the United States Navy. One of the things about the uh, conversations that we have around this format is that we always try to make it a point for the admirals uh, uh, joining us sort of to know each other. And I was particularly pleased when they all uh, accepted our invitation, because as we were discussing with Admiral Jones earlier on, they've all known each other for a long time. And that makes it for a more convivial and hopefully more engaging conversation. I will not spend too much time in introducing each of them. They retired at the top of their respective organization. That in itself is a mark of distinction when it comes to the individuals. But what I'd like to sort of point out is, is three things. Um, one of the things that makes this conversation particularly interesting and very much sort of uh, one in which skills complement each other. Uh, we know that Amil Jones um, uh, uh, trained first and foremost um, uh, as a commanding officer on uh, Royal Navy frigates and then became fleet commander. Um, before becoming first sea lord. So it brings about a considerable wealth of experience and knowledge what happens on surface forces, as it were, one of the dimensions of navies. And Richardson is by trade a submariner, who was director of nuclear reactor in the US Navy before he became chief of naval operations. So it, he has that sort of underwater um, element to it. And Amiral Barrett, even though his expertise and his love affair with the sea goes a long way back, um, brings in um, uh, among his uh, commanding. <laughs> to, if you want, the third dimension, the air dimension of navies today, as well as elements related to um, border protection, the constabulary dimension of navies. So we have a very wide ranging set of experiences that bring uh, together the conversation. Um, the last point before moving on to our uh, guests um, is that one of the things that I particularly enjoyed um, in, in bringing this thing together with the Royal Navy Strategic Studies Centre and the Royal Australian Navy Sea Power Centre was this idea that we are trying to have a conversation in which the uh, naval dimension is part of a broader conversation about the maritime in national security. We will be talking about navies, but not just as a partisan sort of approach to the matter of national defence, but trying to place the conversation about navies and maritime forces in a broader sense into what it means for uh, seafaring nations, maritime nations in the 21st century, what does sort of that element of defence uh, means in national security. And in some respect, I'd like to think that being today 2021, um, we are sort of in doing so trying to revitalise that long-standing link between London and King's College in particular, and the tradition and heritage of Julius who goes in history as the first person 
that tried very much to explain to political elites the distinction between talking about navies and naval strategy and maritime strategy and national security. And here at King's, we will be celebrating uh, uh, Corbett 100 years legacy uh, from starting already now, but down to 2022. And I'm, I'm very pleased to report that among our partners, we have also the Naval War College and again, um, uh, different counterparts, including the Sea Power Centre in Australia. So uh, this is a, this is a really interesting and important point in time. And AUKUS, in a way, provides us the broader umbrella under which we can take the opportunity to host and have this conversation. So um, I would probably start with um, Amino Jones, uh, since he's next to me and then sort of go around uh, the room. One of the things that I did not mention in Amal Jones' uh, biography is that I think he, you were the last first sea lord that experienced uh, one of his first duties in Falklands. And today, of course, looking at places like the Indo-Pacific, which, which are part of this conversation around AUKUS, you always have a palpable sense of anxiety over those some of which, like the, the Chinese Navy, have grown enormously over the last 20 years and certainly have less of a chance to reach back to their own experience in terms of what does combat mean to a modern military organization and how does that shape the experience of those who serve in it? And so I wanted to start as a, as a first question really about what does it mean, what that experience has meant to you and how has that experience sort of informed the way you evolved and you changed? As a, as, a, as a naval professional. Thanks, um, Alessio. And can I say at the outset, it's great to be here as part of this conversation uh, and to be connecting with my old friends, Admiral Richardson and, and Admiral Barrett. Um, Admiral Richardson used the phrase to me the other day, it's like reforming the band, because we have the privilege of leading our navies at the same time, and we do know each other well. So notwithstanding the constraints of technology, I hope this feels to all of you participating like the conversation we would wish it to be. Um, that is a really good question to begin with because you're right, the experience uh, of being in the South Atlantic in 1982 uh, was an extraordinarily formative one for me. Uh, I was a very young officer in the Navy still at the time, completing my fleet training in the amphibious assault ship Fearless, which was the, uh, the flagship, if you like, the lead platform for the landings in San Carlos in May 1982. And not surprisingly, uh, the period leading up to that and the subsequent three months was a very formative time in my career. And I'll touch a little bit on the key lessons of that later. But um, I think it's important also to stress that that's not the only way in which the Royal Navy has experienced combat operations in the last 40 or 50 years. Mm. Um, that might have been the most intense mm. and it might have been the one in which we suffered loss and had to deal with the loss of ships, the loss of aircraft, the loss of people, mm. as well as just being in a conflict zone. Um, but I went on later in my career to see operational service in the Gulf as part of the Iran-Iraq war. I've been at action stations in a frigate in the Straits of Hormuz with shots being fired around me. Um, I commanded a frigate on embargo operations in the Adriatic um, during uh, the wars in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, and then, of course, in the generation after me, lots of people also experience uh, combat in the Iraq and Afghan campaigns uh, and also uh, off the coast of Libya and in many other places too. Mm. But there was an intensity to those extraordinary three months uh, in 1982. And I think the key takeaway for me, um, and interestingly, I've just written some of this in an anthology uh, to a book that uh, is being published to capture uh, the thoughts and, and the record of experience of the the ship's company of HMS Fearless in 1982. The first thing is that very often combat is a come as you are party. You don't get the chance to prepare for it, to train for it. Uh, intelligence, strategic thinking doesn't always position you uh, mm. to be in the right place. And that was certainly what happened to the Royal Navy in 1982, which is not necessarily the same as preparing for the wrong war. We were in 1982 at the height of the Cold War. And although we had to uh, gear up to a different threat uh, and be prepared to fight in a totally different geographical part of the planet, um, I'm not saying 
being in Cold War preparations was the wrong war. We'd also instantly just started the Armilla Patrol, as it was then called, mm. our permanent presence in the Middle East mm, yes. to protect interests and crucially British shipping uh, in that region uh, as the Iran-Iraq war began. And that was a key operational focus for the Royal Navy, which has um, extended right through to today. So. Um, it's not that we were doing the wrong things, we just had a new thing to do mm. that was quite a different preparation for us. Mm. So how do you cope with that? Well, you cope with that by having the most available, high readiness, mm. best trained Navy that you can. And those were the real test of the Royal Navy in the South Atlantic in 1982. You suddenly realise, particularly if you've got to go into combat at short notice, that you have to rely on the personnel and logistic mm. sustainability that you've already got in place because mm. you probably won't have time to build it mm. before you then have to go and execute combat operations and uh, it was extraordinary to see just how good our logistic and personnel readiness was in 1982 mm. and the way the whole uk base was able to gear up behind getting that task group out uh, and able to go south the other thing was uh, recognizing that you may not have the right kits to fight the war with. Um, that was a brutal reminder for the Navy that mm. the reliance we built up through the 70s on um, surface to air missiles, the new way of mm. countering an air threat without layered defense that enabled close in and point defense weapon systems to supplement those long range surface to air mm. missiles was in hindsight a mistake. And we lost ships as a result of it mm. and we're a better Navy as a result of it. And the third thing uh, is the quality of operational sea training. Mm -hmm. uh, we've long been very proud in the UK for having um, an operational sea training organization that is, we believe, second to none. Um, we don't just rely on our own view of that. A lot of our partner navies come and train with us and still do to this day. And it's the realism and the complexity uh, and the full threat scenario that operational sea training throws at the ship's company that gives you a chance of being able to fight and fight through damage to be able to win. So those were mm. really priceless lessons that the Navy learned in mm. 1982 and have been able to share with many of our partner navies. And I was really privileged as a young officer to see that mm. um, and then see how the Navy responded to it over the next 40 years. Wonderful. Um, there's so much you, you already touched upon there. You, you talked about logistics and, and how when crunch time comes about, uh, what you have is really what makes the difference. You talked about uh, um, this this layer of the defence for how the fleet sort of deploys operational sea training, um, but also you mentioned this this very important point uh, as as how the Falklands was was a high hand in terms of of kinetic um, use of the navy, but then operational experience and, and deployments continued throughout the entire period. And this is where I'd like to to bring Admiral Barrett in because of course Admiral, you, you you've got like number of decades under your belt, you've seen it all in many respects. Um, and I wonder, um, the, the complexity, uh, the fact that the Navy is first and foremost a tool of statecraft, it works as part of a country's foreign policy. What does that mean to you in, in, your, in, in, your, in your experience at sea um, and as a naval officer? Um, what does what does it mean to you to be a, to, to be a sailor, to be part of of an organization that most of the time operates away from public attention. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, the average person doesn't get to see what this, it's all about. What, what does that mean to you uh, now that you're looking back at this long-standing experience and engagement with the sea that you've had over 40 years? Thank you. Uh, and again, I'd like to uh, just reinforce the, uh, our thanks for having the opportunity to be part of this. It's, uh, it's great for the Sea Power Centre here in Australia, but uh, personally, to catch up with the rest of the band members and to talk to you all is a, is a great privilege. Uh, my first confession, um, I was actually born in the UK to uh, a, a father who was in the Navy. I spent all my growing life up on uh, naval bases before we moved to Australia. Um, I joined the Navy over here when my father signed the papers when I was a young 16 year old. Um, one of the first roles I had in my training was to actually have an exchange posting with the Royal Navy in 1982. So while Sir Philip was down in the South Atlantic, I was actually in the North Sea in a fishery protection vessel um, conducting operations because Australians were not allowed to join any ship that went south because that was a political decision. Um, 
but I would have to say that, first of all, everything that um, uh, Philip has said around the learnings that came out of that experience, it was readily shed to the Royal Australian Navy, particularly in areas around uh, damage control um, and being prepared to fight the fight that you have today, not tomorrow's fight. So all of those things uh, I have to uh, acknowledge and uh, reinforce. But the second point for me um, was around actually all the other aspects of what is required of someone who is in the Navy to do, um, even when half the fleet, if not three quarters of the fleet, are away uh, on combat operations um, down south, as it was at the time. Uh, the constabulary role that was being done by uh, other ships around the nation continued. Um, and the point that you make that very, very often the uh, a nation population does not fully understand or appreciate the sorts of actions that do need to continue, uh, both in conflict, but also in the routine and the regular um, operations that are conducted by navies as well. Um, I quickly learned that in my time early on. I learned a lot from my experience in the UK in 82. I learned the strength and the commitment and the will of a nation to mobilise in such short notice. And ironically, uh, my ship that I was serving in was actually in Portsmouth at the time. Uh, we were just down there doing operations and I watched an entire Navy reassemble and get ships to sea in the space of 48 hours um, that I have I have not, never seen before, or I had never seen before. And quite frankly, I wonder whether I would see it again in, in some of the ways that uh, I saw the, the commitment. It was a national commitment. It wasn't just the, the Navy. Mm. So I learned a lot at that point, but it did reinforce issues with, uh, for me in my time later as the Chief of Navy, about actually educating the population about why Navy exists, uh, the fabric of the nation that surrounds the Navy and, and, and why it is it is used. Uh, we have a national anthem in Australia and the fourth line talks about being girt by sea. But if you have ask the average Australian, they, they don't look beyond the breakers at Bondi Beach and do not really know what happens outside of that regime. And so a role when you are in a uh, seeking to be a serious Navy and you're seeking to gain support from a government for the serious actions as the Falklands demonstrated, that you need to prepare for and constantly be aware of, you need to bring the, the population with you. And so you need to be able to educate them. So I found many lessons myself in the Falklands beyond the operational side. Uh, it led me to write a book about what it means to be in the Navy and what the nation needs to know about its Navy and what the Navy needs to tell its nation. Because if you're going to spend national treasure, if you that includes the sons and daughters of Australians, not just the, the taxpayers' funds, but if you're going to uh, to do all that, you need to be able to express a real sense and purpose uh, of why the Navy exists. So it's a sort of an ephemeral answer, um, but Sir Philip gave a, a great indication of what navies have to do in a combat area. I agree with all of that. Um, what I'm trying to highlight here is the, the, the broad sense of what also has to be expressed to the nation that uh, supports, raises the Navy, and then a government that commits a Navy into conflict. If I may stay with you for a second, um, I wanted to ask you something about, the, you mentioned the book that you, you wrote about the, the, the Navy and, 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 and Australia and the nation, which if I remember correctly, was published on, on the back of the uh, uh, the, the, the defence of the and of 2016. And so uh, back in 2016, the overall security landscape around Australia look differently. Um, and certainly the tones of the defence white paper and the, the strategic direction of travel, as it were, um, seemed rather different from the one that the Morrison government has captured this year uh, with, uh, you know, with, 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 as, as, as the background to AUKUS taking place and the negotiations taking place. Um, to what extent do you think that at the time the debate was in the right place, or perhaps not anticipating changing uh, that was um, happening in the region, particularly in so far as China's behaviour is concerned. And if you were to come back, what would you change today uh, in your book uh, that perhaps you did not sort of include or, 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 or tackle 
the first time around when the general narrative around the, the, the security landscape was different. Look, I'll answer the last, the second question first, and that is nothing in terms of the commitment to actually demonstrate um, the, the reason why you would wish to raise and a, a Navy and what it means to be able to be successful in in acting as a Navy on behalf of the government as an instrument of policy. Um, but the circumstances in uh, the white paper in 2016 were different. Mm. There was a growing, well, there was an acknowledgement of the growing rise of China in the region. And there had been a subtle change over a number of years that had moved from what traditionally had been a sort of continental view of, of a strategy of what was uh, had been foremost in previous white papers. Uh, the issue around a maritime century was, was well and truly uh, in place. But there was a broader issue about actually trying to build our own industrial stocks to mm. create a sovereign capability, which in doing so takes time. And so the concept that was coming out of the white paper at the time was both delivery of capability, but also delivery of a sovereign ability to create future capability. What then transpired over a period of time very rapidly and was uh, was detailed in the defence uh, strategic update in 2020 was that time was not available to Australia, to the government. And the view there was, and it, I guess it comes back to a point made earlier, um, you need to fight with what you've got. And the reality is you need to be able to uh, have a, a process that brings your capability into service um, as soon as you can. You need to maximise the current capability that you have. You need to maximise the services and the arrangements around it, the, the workforce, the the, uh, the training uh, and all those elements. Um, and so a fine balance has been put in place now to continue and to accelerate the process of delivery of capability, but still with a view that Australia in our region will still need to be able to generate its own sovereign capability to bring the next, the future, future submarine, the future, future frigate into service. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, Andrew Jones, we're talking about the Indo-Pacific, we're talking about how things have changed for Australia, how much things have changed for Britain. Uh, in the last sort of four or five years, we went from January 2018 when HMS Sutherland was the first frigate to go down um, in the region after uh, 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 a hiatus of about five years, because I think last time was in 2013. And then we've we've had assets going down at times of overlapping deployments, but constantly being deployed there this year, culminating with um, CSG. You were there when, the, when these, these things were happening at the beginning. What kind of challenges, if you're sitting as a first sea lord, you're looking at about, you, you're looking at how things are, are widening. What sort of challenges and opportunities this presents um, to, to the Royal Navy? Because, of course, the Royal Navy never withdrew from East of Suez. But the meaning of, of, of what East of Suez means to the Royal Navy has changed certainly quite considerably. So uh, then with the Indo-Pacific tilt coming out in the Indicator Review as, as a key concept in the widening of the horizons of, of, of the country's sort of national security landscape, what did it mean at the time to be there and see all of this unfolding? Well, it meant it meant a huge amount, and um, you know, and, and Tim will sympathise with this. We discuss this quite a bit when we're serving as chiefs that um, getting the political direction as the head of the navy in the UK to uh, to tilt towards the Indo-Pacific is mostly an opportunity, mm. but of course it's a challenge too. And I was very keen that the Royal Navy was in a place to exploit that opportunity. Um, and the first way you can exploit it is by the very flexibility and agility of naval forces. Um, you can move them, not at the speed of, of air forces, of mm. course, um, but with much of their own inbuilt logistics sustainability relatively quickly. Uh, and it's just a question of making sure if the political direction comes to tilt one way, um, your political masters understand that that is going to have to have some kind of reverse tilt because ah. you can't be in two places at the same time. So um, as we started to gear up our scheduling and our sustainability of the Royal Navy mm. more with an Indo-Pacific tilt in 2018, uh, we also had to think about, well, this is going to mean probably 
less presence of our ships in the standing NATO maritime groups mm. and the standing NATO um, mine countermeasures groups in the Euro-Atlantic theatre, oh. but what was still an appropriate level of response there. Um, absolutely, uh, as Tim pointed out, about the presence we kept for constabulary duties in UK waters in mm. 1982, we had to sustain that. And we also had to make sure we kept a credible anti-submarine warfare capability in the Euro-Atlantic mm. theatre, mm. because at the same time that we were asked to tilt to the Indo-Pacific, we were being challenged by um, the Russian Naval Submarine Force uh, reasserting itself into mm. the North Atlantic in a very powerful way. Those two things came at the same time. So we had to balance the disposition carefully. But we chose to do so uh, in a way that would take capability into the region that would make a difference and would be noticed. So as you say, the first ship out there was an anti-submarine warfare frigate, HMS Southern, with 2087 Todoray sonar on a Merlin helicopter deliberately designed to make the point about this is a capability we think mm. alongside our uh, our counterpart navies in the region like the Royal Australian Navy is becoming an increasingly important part of the ask there. Um, but I learned a great truism early on in my career that I had to keep coming back to again and again as first sea lord which is don't over promise and under deliver. Mm. Um, and that's where you've got to keep the challenge balanced against the opportunity mm. to have suddenly gone to my political master and said, yeah, we can do this. We can provide a continuous one point north presence of Royal Navy destroyers and frigates in the Indo-Pacific region mm. from here on in. Well, in 2018, we couldn't quite do that. Mm. But I felt confident to do what we did do with the promise of more to come because we were at that stage planning for the Carrier Strike Group 21 mm. deployment. We didn't know exactly what form it would take. We didn't even know exactly what construct it would have. And I'm delighted to have seen after I've retired the precise form and construct it's taken, where that strike group has gone and what it's done. And also the infusion of integrated allied capability it's had at the heart of it, mm. a US Marine Corps F-35B squadron, a US Navy destroyer, a Dutch Navy destroyer, integrated elements of other navies coming into the strike group at various stages. All that was in the planning process. So we knew we would be able to, as it were, culminate with that offer mm. as part of the tilt three years, three years down the pipe. The other thing it did, and this is um, not just a nod to Admiral Barrett being present now, but um, a genuine sense of reaffirmation of a very old and well-found link with our partners in the region. Um, mm. As a, as a young officer, I joined my first ship as a midshipman um, in Sydney, in Australia, as part of a five ship Royal Navy group deploying to that region. Um, that was an extraordinary opportunity, but also a demonstration of continuing determination then in a much bigger Navy, albeit mm. to have ships in that region, notwithstanding the withdrawal from the east of Suez. I was trained as um, a frigate navigator doing my own operational sea training mm. uh, in the mid 80s uh, by a particularly tough Australian specialist navigator at Portland who drilled into me uh, how to navigate your ship in combat and I will mm. always be grateful to him for that I think. Um, I was trained as a principal warfare officer at our School of Maritime Operations by an Australian course officer but those links had to a degree dissipated a mm. little bit mm. as we bought different cape maritime capability and focused on different key areas. So to reassert that link and find that all that we held dear in the Royal Australian Navy and recognised was still there. And I think as we brought that back to bear in the last couple of years, mm. um, under the auspices of AUKUS, which is very new, as you say, and we're still exploring our way into that, um, but also through the fact we're both buying the same next generation high-end anti-submarine warfare frigate the Type 26 in UK, the Hunter class frigate in Australia. It's a great reaffirmation of that bond between us. And, and you're making a very important point here about August is not coming out of nowhere. And yes, there are a lot of questions still out there in terms of the details, but I think there is this long-standing bond. And, and even the Kings, we've seen it with, with students coming from the different navies who you know have spent time um, other you know, Australians in the UK, um, uh, Royal Naval Officers who spent time in, in, in Australia. So that sort of bond, it, 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 it's there. It's been there for a long time. And as you say, 
the interesting thing is that the political opportunity now is coming back to reinvigorate and expand it. I, I very much enjoyed a number of points that you were both touching upon. Um, and, 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 and before we open uh, the, the question to the floor, a couple of things that sort of came back to me that I, I found were really interesting. Um, we all find ourselves in a situation where resources are always very tight and capabilities available are essential, but, but, but at heart, it seems to me that one theme that is emerging is this question of uh, having the right time. Capability is not just about always having the 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 coolest uh, uh, shiny piece of kit available. It's also the one that is the right one for the particular activity that you have in time. You, you have in mind at that particular point in time. So that the, the element of, of being relevant and 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 timely as well. And um, and the point you were making about the frigate going down there as opposed in 2018 as opposed to one of the newer destroyers. It really makes this point very important. It was about relevance, um, timeless, and and again, this other point that is emerging that you both mentioned about partnerships and alliances and how that practical level of persistency in the cooperation and interaction is essential to elevate the quality, the nature, the depth of, of, of the relationship. So we've got a lot on the plate and, and so far, I haven't asked any one of the hard questions because I'm supposed to be the nice one in this in this in this gig. Um, but but we have um, a very large crowd here in the room and a very large crowd in um, uh, on on teams. And um, so from this point onwards, I would invite everyone to raise their hands. We have someone manning uh, the chat, so we will collect questions as we move along. I will start taking the first question uh, from the floor here as people um, uh, gather their thoughts on. Uh, um, on, on on teams as well um, and we'll try to get through all of them. Ah, Admiral Richardson, there you are. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good. I'm sorry I had some technical difficulties, but I'm uh, happy to join the team. Wonderful. Um, well, I mean, it, we were about we were about to to to, to go to to the broader sort of uh, opening the floor to, to to the room. But before we do so, perhaps um, it would be nice to 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 have you joining in the conversation. We've been talking about partnerships. We've been talking about the importance of renewing uh, ties. And and I understand that uh, that, that that you've all been sort of personally involved, the three of you, in in making that possible and making that a reality. Uh, during your time as chiefs of the of the navies, uh, and and we were talking about also about the Indo-Pacific and the centrality of the Indo-Pacific um, to how Australia and, and and Britain's national security um, is changing. So I was wondering whether whether perhaps you could join us today and yeah. give us um, a few thoughts about uh, these and more, so that we can set the stage for the bro the broader conversation with with the questions coming from the floor afterwards. Certainly, Alessio, and thank you uh, for bringing us all together. <clears throat> Some uh, certainly partners as we uh, were chiefs of our respective Navy, but also very good friends. And uh, just to sort of uh, put an exclamation point on the point that, that the, uh, the the topic you just mentioned, <clears throat> I think that, the, you know, I, I came from the submarine community and uh, it, it's a community where uh, you've got a very, very strong culture, I suppose, right? And uh, <clears throat> you've got a culture that is uh, one that uh, is founded on making a meaningful contribution to uh, the Navy's contribution to national security. It's founded on, uh, the culture is founded on a sort of a harsh recognition of the uh, unforgiving nature of operating at sea. And I would say that that culture is also shared more broadly by a nation's respective navies. And uh, I make that point only to say that uh, these cultural these cultural commonalities between navies of the world uh, I've found to be a tremendous uh, starting point, or if not a starting point, a way to strengthen ties between maritime nations. Mm. And uh, you know, the Indo-Pacific, I think we would all agree, is very largely maritime theater. And so I see just tremendous opportunity for a relationship building. You talked about the importance of the Indo-Pacific theater. You know, as you know, the United States, uh, like Australia, is a Pacific nation. You know, our, our West Coast and, Aust and uh, Alaska 
have vast uh, coastlines that uh, are on the Pacific. We've been engaged in the Pacific at least since the middle of the 20th century, if you know, if not before. Uh, and uh, it's a it's a theater right now that undergoing tremendous change. And I think that uh, you know, I see uh, Admiral uh, Philip Jones next to you. I think he would agree that it's an important uh, enough part of the world that uh, we are all uh, Pacific nations to some degree, right? The, uh, the 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 prosperity and the fortune of the United Kingdom is also uh, very much dependent upon stability and uh, the free movement of trade and security in the Indo-Pacific region. I think that nobody's probably uh, opined on this more uh, uh, thoughtfully than Admiral Barrett. Uh, Tim, very, very good to see you again. <laughs> and so, uh, again, just, you know, navies as a foundation to uh, start or strengthen uh, partnerships between maritime nations and the fact that this Indo-Pacific region uh, brings us you know, together uh, as it becomes that, that much more of a, a central focus for the world, really. Uh, yeah, I, I think I've probably repeated a number of things that uh, have been said today, but uh, by means of joining the conversation, those are my initial thoughts. Thank you so much for, for saying that, because actually you're adding something else that we hadn't had the time to, to touch upon, and that is really uh, how the Indo-Pacific is, is becoming important, not just to nations within the region, however broadly one defines them, but it, it is a, a space of interest for all uh, nations that rely on, on trade, transport, connectivity, um, access, um, as an underlying element to their national prosperity. So this is not a question that, that is limited to a particular group of countries. Um, it is a question that one way or another, we all have to engage with. And another point that you made that I think is very important to underline um, is, is this question of the inherent maritime nature of the Indo-Pacific as, as, as a maneuver space, um, as a geopolitical space, and of course it, as a geoeconomic space, because again, maritime connectivity, whether physical or digital, rests on sea lanes of communication and underwater sea cables. So um, in, in that sense, um, this is a very important point because as I was saying at the beginning, um, this isn't just a conversation about navies. It's, from the, it's a conversation about how navies contribute to address a fundamental element that links security and prosperity in more than national security debates. So um, we've got a lot on our plates and, and what I'll, I'll try to do as, as my colleagues uh, collect the questions coming from uh, uh, teams, I'll, I'll just look around the room and start seeing uh, the first hands. Yes, sir. Would you mind, um, just as a, as a general rule, um, if you could just sort of um, say who you are in your affiliation, um, and again, the same on, on Teams, um, and please bear in mind that the, 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 the answers are not for uh, um, attribution, but for the purpose of the conversation today. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Robert Centuri with the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense uh, Army uh, Navy, but um, I had a question, and this is a little bit of a sensitive question on the other side of the pond, so I figured I would ask it here instead. Uh, <laughs> do you see, does it make sense, in terms of aircraft carriers, going forward, do you see that in the, in the U.S. Navy in particular to, to be launching a new class of aircraft carrier when you have such an advanced anti-ship missiles, you have, yes, instead of yesterday now, is the, the bf 21 b for the Chinese. Um, and if that, if it doesn't make sense enough to be the vice critical component of your, your naval grand strategy, what platform or what strategy would you see in place on that? Wonderful. Uh, that's an excellent question. And, and, and just, um, uh, perhaps before Admiral Richardson tells us something about it, I might actually start with Admiral Jones because we have had just the carrier that is still on its way back from that part of the world. How do we respond to this? It's a very common and legitimate question about the changing balance between land and sea in geostrategic terms. Weapons, land-based weaponry, it's expanding its radius and what kind of problem that presents for carrier strike groups and what kind of limitations of rethink the lands of us in terms of the uh, uh, importance and, and centrality of carrier strike groups on, on fleet balances? Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. And um, it's one that you won't be surprised to hear that the UK has grappled with uh, in a very significant way over the last few years as we've contemplated a return to, um, to big deck strike carrier operations. Um, and, and back to the earlier question we were looking at, it, it's all about a balance of challenge and opportunity. So the opportunity that ships like that give you is to do what the carrier strike group 2021 deployment has just been achieving. 
Um, it is a, a, a very significant physical and totemic presence that a nation can put into a region to say exactly as Admiral Richardson was saying, you know, we, we care about this region because significant trade flows through this region. Uh, the ability to have free access to the sea and open trade routes is important to all nations concerned about global trade in the world, not just those who are physically in a particular region. And the presence of aircraft carriers gives you the opportunity to uh, to have strike power available, um, plus a whole range of other powers as well. You know, the great thing about a big deck and rotary wing capability or tilt rotor capability is you can pivot into humanitarian operations, you can pivot into um, more amphibious centered operations, uh, you know, whatever it is that the call uh, of the, uh, the political requirement of that day is. And there's something unique about the nations that have chosen to have that capability, either retained over a long period, mm. as it has been in the United States Navy, or to pivot back into it, as the Royal Navy has done, as the Indian Navy is doing at the moment, and, and others, that it's a demonstration of, you know, this high-end, global, deployable, flexible toolkit mm. that a carrier striker brings. Now, um, the threat, of course, is part of the challenge of that. There are mm. places in the world where you've got to be really careful about putting such a high-priced, high-end, significant national asset as an aircraft carrier. And yes, you can layer defence it, mm. and yes, you can integrate into a partner nation's sophisticated layer defence, but there are some threats that will test even that. So it's a constant dialogue about where do you want it to be, what do you want it to achieve, and where is it dangerous to put it. But um, as a kind of land versus sea debate, and you know, we sailors always say this, no matter how vulnerable it might be, you can move it. It's not <laughs> a fixed target. You've got to find it. It can go silent electronically. It can move mm -hmm. at great speed. And it's not as vulnerable as a fixed target to these kind of threats that might be posed against it. So now that's not me saying it can go with impunity anywhere and defend mm -hmm. itself. That's a constant balance of capability versus threat but it does give you choices. Wonderful. And um, um, Richardson, would you like to jump in and, and say something specific about the US Navy? Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's a debate that uh, is uh, been as vigorous in the United States as it has been in the United Kingdom. Um, and I would just emphasize a lot of the points that uh, Admiral Jones made. You know, one is that, uh, you know, one of my favorite plays is Henry V, right? And uh, you know, you had this great battle of Agincourt, which was all about, you know, precision strike, uh, you know, of its time, right? Uh, and so, you know, Henry V was just able to outreach with precision uh, his enemy at the time. And, and so it's been back and forth, you know, this is just mm -hmm. the way that, uh, the, the way that uh, warfare has developed. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I would say that there's, you know, a, a shift in it, uh, an exponential shift, perhaps, which uh, I think rides that technology curve, that exponential technology curve, where we've democratized uh, in many regards the ability to strike at distance with precision, uh, the ubiquitous uh, sensing network out there that can be leveraged, and then, uh, you know, just technology becoming that much more cheaper. And then, of course, uh, when we're talking about some threats, particularly in the Pacific, there's you know, significant investment to, that's been made to do this at a very high end. But uh, similarly, there's been investment uh, made in technologies on the defense. Uh, I think that in particular uh, advances in directed energy, if you just take uh, Admiral Jones's discussion to one more step, <clears throat> all of the steps in the chain that have to culminate in uh, to, to have a successful strike on a moving target you know, mm. each one of those steps can be uh, deconstructed and, and frustrated by uh, a, a well-informed and uh, technologically uh, equipped uh, carrier strike group, right? And, um, and so, you know, if you think about the initial location, the passing of that information of the location to some kind of a battle network, that battle network converting that to, you know, targeting information, passing that to a weapon that weapon has to launch a great deal of time. In the meantime, you know, as as Admiral Jones said, the, the target is on the move, and uh, and so there's going to have to be an update to that target. You know, all of those steps can be uh, deconstructed and interrupted. I, I think, in fact, 
I wouldn't be surprised, Alessio, if once more the pendulum swings to the defense and it mm. becomes much, much harder to hit something that's on the move than it is to uh, defend yourself, right? And so this is just kind of the back and forth. And of course, there'll be a response to that, right? So I think that uh, to, to isolate in on this as something brand new in the history of warfare is a bit uh, narrow. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, the ability for a carrier strike group, somebody said it's an aircraft carrier Alan Jones and I were talking yesterday, it's not so much a carrier as it is a launcher and recovery, a cover <laughs> aircraft, right? That's how it has its impact. And its ability to dwell on station and use its aircraft to really uh, uh, impose its will on a vast area uh, for a long, a sustained period of time, uh, you know, that's a, a remarkable capability. Uh, and so, I, you know, I, I'm bullish on these going forward. I don't know, thank you so much. I think you first touch upon two very important points here always to keep in mind. First of all, of course, it's, it's a moving target, but also a moving target that can be quite hard to detect. It looks very big when you see it in port or anchored somewhere, but it's still in the middle of the ocean. And from an electronic point of view, there are now ways to to counter its visibility, as it were. And, and I'm going to reach this, you make a very important point about the fact that, that uh, sort of offense, defense, and, and the relationship between different type of capabilities, it, it's also a moving target. It changes constantly. And so, yeah. um, it, 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 again, it's it's a mistake to just look at it as, oh, this is a really large floating target waiting to be hit from from, from someone. Um, I wanted to bring Anil Barrett in here because there's there's a couple of questions uh, in the chat which I think are, are, are quite important and I've heard um, uh, been asked quite often since since August was 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 announced. One from from Tokyo and one from Oxford, um, which is um, um, an odd combination if you want, but still bringing together um, a similar point. One, uh, how AUKUS or how are other partners of Australia, uh, the UK, the US in the region should look at AUKUS? Is AUKUS a potentially an opportunity for them? And perhaps I, I'd love to hear your thoughts about the fact that AUKUS is not just about the submarines, but it's a broader umbrella agreement over technology and defence. And perhaps if you had any thought um, about this, I would be particularly grateful for it. And, and, and on the back of this, perhaps also, um, it, I emphasise in what ways AUKUS, this is a question from Oxford, from Oxford um, is, is, is cast a slightly different light on the meaning of uh, cooperation and relationship uh, today. Is AUKUS part of this growing and expanding ways in which alliances are morphing into? And the Indo-Pacific is one of the places. Look at the quads, look at the trilaterals, look at how the hub and spokes uh, alliance system is changing. So these two elements, and I'd like to start with you. One, how should other partners look at, at, at AUKUS as, as, as a potential opportunity? And two, is AUKUS also telling us something about how multilateralism is evolving in that part of the world? Cool. Um, look, the first point would be uh, AUKUS itself, whilst it, whilst some of the outcomes of it came as a little surprise to all of us, um, I, I freely admit um, I, I got up early on a, a morning uh, midweek to hear an announcement by the Prime Minister and uh, the announcement was at 7 o'clock and at 6.59 we were a non-nuclear nation and at 7 o'clock we were a nuclear nation. Um, so. It, it was quite a surprising uh, announcement, but the the underpinning part was you've got three three nations that are uh, already already readily aligned under Five Eyes and under a number of other organisations, certainly with the UK and the FTPA in in the region. Um, there's no surprise that we would come together where our common attributes can be shared. The issue here is the trust that's needed when one of the outcomes of this particular engagement was to share a nuclear capability for a submarine propulsion for Australia in particular. Not that AUKUS is only about that, as you said, um, but that was the uh, uh, one of the uh, crowning parts of it. Uh, there's a level of trust that didn't arise just overnight before that announcement was made. It's an enduring trust and I think we've established that already by saying the level of cooperation and engagement that the, these three navies have had some time, uh, the relationships that have been developed between the uh, the workforces within those navies, 
the thought processes and what we have learned from each other are all relevant in why this should not be a surprise. There was a common theme. Uh, this is an organized outcome to be able to solve that. And that's that's the message that is being expressed to our other partners in the region. Um, this is not a, uh, a reiteration of a, of a colonial view. This is three serious navies with serious business that have a shared common interest and a shared capability, in some cases commercial, as uh, as Admiral Jones said earlier, uh, in terms of the future frigate programs that are being shared by both the UK and by Australia. So there's a real reason and purpose behind it. That said, uh, there is a need for this to be sold within our region for demonstrating that they are the real purposes behind it. Uh, Australia uh, as a nation and various governments up to this point have spent a lot of time in the Asian region uh, building a level of trust and cooperation among our partners. And you only need to look at the various collective multilateral organisations that do exist. Everything from uh, at a political level from ASEAN, which started as a, as a group of 10 and then went to ASEAN plus three, then it went to ASEAN plus six, um, depending on the, the need economically or militarily for people to share those sorts of things. Um, it is quite possible that these things build and grow and move. Mm -hmm. um, the Quad is another example of that. So I, I am not concerned that this will become a difficult thing for the region to accept, but I do think it needs to be explained in its full sense of why it is being developed and the benefits that will accrue if in combination uh, these three navies can assist in stability and as, as Mahan, McMahon, Corbett and many others have said, maritime stability equals prosperity. Um, and so it is very important that we demonstrate that there is a purpose and a reason behind why this is being done. Mm. It's not a response to a competitive drive per se. Thank you so much. I'm going to leave you to Would you like also to, to jump in with this and, and, and sort of add, add to them? What, what is the meaning of all this um, to other partners in the region? Is this something that can be opened up as time comes, as, as it sort of expanded uh, depending on the areas and the directions of travel it takes? Yeah, Leslie, I'll just uh, say that I think uh, Admiral Barrett summed it up very nicely. It's just such a dynamic region right now, and you see these uh, arrangements and agreements, you know, coming uh, and, and forming. Uh, and uh, it, as you said, it is going to be very important to sort of put this in the context of the greater dynamism of the region, right? And so I would say that uh, just as AUKUS is much more uh, than just about a nuclear submarine deal, right? Uh, I would say that uh, it's also much more than just about these three nations that have kicked this off and that eventually uh, it will have tentacles and inclusions of all the other nations. And I mean, it really has to, doesn't it, Alessio? It, it just, uh, in order to be successful, it's gonna have to be uh, you know, made part of the, the fiber out there. I like it too because it's another multinational arrangement, right? And so, you know, sitting from my chair, I always get a little bit, uh, I guess, concern might be too strong a word, but uh, I take note when uh, the discussion collapses too quickly to some kind of a bilateral construct, you know? And so, uh, this is going to be a regional uh, matter, it's going to have a regional solution. I think that uh, AUKUS is going to be a part of that regional solution. And so I look forward to, uh, you know, you know, partic the, the United States Navy participating in any way that it can. No, James. Yeah, I've got nothing to add to that. I think that's been very eloquently described. I think that's exactly how I see it. I think it's exactly the opportunity the UK sees it. You know, it's important to recognize, as Admiral Barrett said, it doesn't subvert any of the existing multilateral arrangements in the region, the Quad, the Five Eyes, ASEAN. It, it, it is a powerful, to me, a powerful geopolitical statement by three nations about their intent in the region. It has obviously the kind of hard 
maritime capability edge to it of a mm. nuclear submarine capability for Australia, but it'll become much more than that. And I think you know we need to see see it working out over time, and who else comes and uh, and, and maybe participates in it too. And this is a wonderful note upon which we probably have to draw this to um, an end. Um, it's always lovely to, to to have a feeling that there's more that one would want from a conversation and definitely have this feeling. So so it means that we've done our job, right? We we, we planted the seeds for a conversation that I think will continue. And I very much um, uh, uh, like to sort of uh, draw upon the, the, the point that Admiral Barrett was making that explaining what AUKUS is about allows us an opportunity to sort of develop and articulate its meaning in a way that it becomes uh, not exclusive but inclusive. It attracts others and it creates an opportunity to keep that uh, point that uh, Amel Richardson was making, uh, a region that is so diverse and, and wide, multilateral, and, and try to find a multilateral dimension um, to um, a solution to, to, to the security challenges that we're facing, and certainly not one that excludes other mechanisms, but joins them with a particular sort of trust um, and, and with a particular sense of why nations do come together. And today we looked at some of the aspects of it, heritage, culture, capabilities, and a shared understanding of what maritime connectivity means to national security today. So it's been an absolute delight and pleasure to see so many of you joining us today. I can see there are uh, still many questions in the in the chat and we won't be able to answer them all, but perhaps that gives me an opportunity to think about creating other opportunities in the near future to continue this conversation. For now, I just want to thank everybody for joining us today and uh, wish you all a very lovely day. End of the day for Amir uh, uh, Barrett and, 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 and a lovely day for you, Amir Richardson, back in on the East Coast. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Admiral Jones. Goodbye now from Kings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.